coming back here. It was uh, on the last day of last year that I was here last, and we talked a little bit about uh, last year. This morning, I would like us to think a little bit about this coming year and what it will look like for connections, what it's going to look like for Christians really around the globe, if you will. And I'd like to begin by telling a story, and it's a story about uh, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lu uh, Lieutenant uh, William Clark, who were way back in 1804 commissioned by President Thomas Jefferson to explore the newly acquired Louisiana Purchase and the Northwest Territory of the North American continent. And they were given a mission, and their mission was to find and to map a navig navigable water route across the continent. And so to somehow figure out a way to get from the East Coast to the West Coast. And Jefferson understood that if the country was going to be successful economically and be able to maintain that new acquired uh, Louisiana Purchase, they were going to need to know how to get across the continent. And so the plan that Lewis and Clark came up with was to uh, canoe up the Missouri all the way to the headwaters in the Rocky Mountains and then to carry their canoes over the Continental Divide, hook up with the Columbia River, and then ride that river down to the Pacific. And there's a picture we have here of, of the route that they actually uh, took in that time. Now, that mission, that plan, was based on two very common beliefs of the time. One was that there actually was a navigable water route to the Pacific Ocean. And two, and most importantly, frankly, that the western half of the North American continent looked pretty much like the eastern half of the continent. That is, there was this gradual sloping plain leading to the mountains, from the mountains to the ocean. Well, after 15 months of travel, after a harsh win a winter, after losing one of their crew members and finally getting to the headwaters of the Missouri River, high up in the Rocky Mountains, one morning, Captain Lewis was hiking to scout out the rest of the journey. He might, makes his way up that morning to the top of the Continental Divide, exuberant. He, all he had to do now was to carry the canoes over the Continental Divide and find the Snake River and make his way down to the Pacific. But when he got to the top of the Continental Divide, in the words of one historian, he could not have been more disappointed because instead of finding a sloping gradual plain down to the Pacific, he found he was looking at the most terrible mountain range he had ever beheld. He was looking at the rugged peaks of the Bitterroot Mountains and they stretched as far as the eye could see. And it was at that moment that he realized that everything that they had previously believed was wrong. There was no water route to the Pacific Ocean, and the western half of the continent was nothing like the eastern half of the continent. And that discovery, that rude awakening, frankly, changed everything for Lewis and Clark their mission remained the same, to find a route to the Pacific Ocean, but their method, their uh, methodology, their approach was going to have to change dramatically. They were going to have to innovate now. They were going to have to adapt. And most importantly, they were going to have to ditch the canoes and become, become mountaineers. Now that story is told by a pastor named Todd Bolsinger from the West Coast, because he believes that America, in this moment, finds itself in a similar situation in these early years of the 21st century. For decades now in America, we've doing, been doing ministry in a particular way. 
believing that as long as we build nice churches like this one, hold exciting worship services, run great programs, we will continue to reach people for Christ and advance his kingdom. But having crossed the 21st century mark, if you will, we find ourselves looking at an entirely different terrain. We have our own, as a church, uh, Bitterroot Mountains we're looking at, and it looks real different than what we expected because the world in front of us bears, frankly, little resemblance to the century behind us. Church attendance in America is plummeting. In fact, it's in free fall in many mainline denominations. We're on, we see a rise of what are known as the nuns, people who claim no religious beliefs or affiliation at all. There's a growing, strident atheism that is becoming more and more prominent. A postmodern view of truth and morality where truth is really something that each person has to decide for themselves about. We see a downright disenfranchisement of people who were born in the 1990s and the cultural competition for uh, what people do with their time, especially their weekends, has led to increasingly a cynical view of church life. And if those things are true for America in general, they are doubly, triply true for the front range area of Colorado. Well, that unsettling view should be as transformative for us as it was for Lewis and Clark and their core of discovery. In Bolsinger's words, Lewis and Clark and their a core of discovery we're about to go off the map and into uncharted territory. They were going to have to change their plans. They were going to have to give up their expectations. They were going to have to reframe their mission because what lay in front of them was nothing like what was behind them. And I'll suggest to you that the same is true for the church as we attempt to spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus and his kingdom today. If you think, if we think we can keep doing church the same old way we have always done church, we are kidding ourselves. You can't canoe the mountains. It just doesn't work. I mean, just think for a moment of the people you know, people in your neighborhood, maybe the people you work with, people in your school, your apartment building, how many of them woke up this morning and said, I wonder which church I should try out today? How many of them look at the Bible as a, res a reliable source of truth and the way to find a good and happy life? How many believe the church has any kind of relevancy in our world today for good? The cultural terrain has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. In the words of one popular blogger, too many churches are perfectly equipped to reach a world that no longer exists. So like Lewis and Clark their core of discovery, we're going to have to reframe our mission. We're going to have to innovate and adapt and discover new ways to build Christ's church and spread good news and advance his kingdom. And so today, I would like to have us take a look at some familiar verses from the end of the Gospel of Matthew probably words that you have heard sermons about over the years, times I have preached over the years. But in this passage, I read it again a few weeks back, and it hit me like a, a bucket of cold water in a whole new way. And so let me, if I can, read for you, and I think we'll have the words on the screen as well, from Matthew 28, beginning with verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. 
when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with, with you always to the very end of the age. Now, these are some of Jesus' final words before leaving the earth to go to heaven. And final words are important. When you speak your final words, you think carefully about what you want to say, what you want to leave behind for the people around you. And so we have to believe that Jesus has thought carefully about these last words he is leaving his disciples. And he begins here by reminding them of his power and his authority. I mean, just think about it. He has healed every imaginable kind of disease and injury. He has delivered people from all kinds of darkness he has commanded the forces of nature. He has confounded the religious authorities. He has conquered death and the grave. I mean, this man is in charge. He can say and do whatever he wants. And he want, what he wants to say is go. And what he wants to do is to have those disciples of him, his go and to the world and share that good news with the people around him, to point people toward him. And so he sends his disciples out into the world to point people toward him. Go and make disciples, he says. Those are the last words that we have from him. And he leaves them to those first disciples and by extension to us, knowing full well that we'd be following in the footsteps of those first disciples so many years later. Now, just for a moment, think about what Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say, all authority has been given to me, therefore, have a worship service. He doesn't say, all authority has been given to me, therefore, her. Join a Bible study, or be in a small group, or have a potluck together. Now, all those things are, are just fine, and he fully expects people would be doing those things, but he wanted to leave them with words that would still be impressed upon us these 2,000 years later. Go make disciples. Now, scholars are clear that there's really just one command here, the one command, the one imperative, is make disciples. And it's just really one word in the Greek. And they also agree, scholars do, that the word go is to go with that theme of making disciples. Go and make disciples, leading people to faith in Christ, baptizing them, training them in the Jesus way of living. And Jesus also makes clear here that he is leaving behind them, for them, a movement, not an institution. He doesn't want his followers to be hunkering down or hiding out or hanging on until he comes back. He wants us to hit the road to win new converts and followers to carry on his work in the world. Because you see, he knew the people were never going to come to his way of life on their own. I mean, remember, he is part of an outlaw religion. He has been rejected by the population denounced by the religious leaders, publicly executed by the government. He is in every eye around him a failure, a loser, dead in their minds. Who would ever follow someone like that? I mean, we think we have a 
tough environment we live in today to do ministry. Our time is nothing like what it was back then. When Jesus issues this command, there were probably uh, about 100 folks that were gathered on that hillside, and some of them, we're told, were doubting. Jesus knew that no one was going to become a follower of his on their own. The disciples were going to have to go. Now, for decades... The functional word in church ministry has been come, come to church, uh, come to youth group, come to Bible study, uh, come and see, come and hear, come and experience. And listen, when the general sense of our culture was that church is a good thing and the Bible has important things to say, that there really is a heaven and a hell to be reckoned with, that come and see approach worked pretty well. But those days are over. You can't canoe the mountains. You can't keep doing church the same old way and expect people to just show up. And so... I want us to hear these words of Jesus again. Go, go and find people. Go and point people. Go and show people what my kingdom is all about. And this is a fundamental switch in our approach as churches in America today from a come and see sort of approach to a go and do, from an attractional kind of model to a, a missional approach. Our ministry, our messages, our prayers, our hearts need to be focused out there, engaging people who are far from God in church and faith. Now, now, before anybody panics, it doesn't mean we're going to stop having worship services or Bible studies or potlucks or any of the other wonderful things that fill a place like this. We don't want you to stop inviting people to come to services on Sunday morning. I mean, Lewis and Clark pitched their canoes when they ran into the Bitterroot Mountains, but they were going to have to rebuild them again when they got to the Columbia River. And so we don't need to ditch the come and see approach. That's one of the reasons some of you are here this morning. You've enjoyed the worship or the ministry to kids or to young people. It's just that in the new world we find ourselves in, if we don't combine come and see with go and do, in fact, if we don't lead with go and do, no one's going to find us here. I mean, I've been around the Denver area for 30 years, and I've watched when this facility was first built, and all of us ministers thought, this is just going to be a, a perfect location. I mean, it's in Highlands Ranch. Uh, you can see it from 470. It's easy to get to. It will be filled with people in no time. But that approach doesn't work anymore. In fact, I'll suggest another approach. If we don't lead with go and do, no one is going to bother to come and see. In fact, that's going to be a point if you want to look up on the screen. If we don't lead with go and do, nobody's going to come and see. If we don't go and do... No one's going to know about what we have. We have to win visibility and credibility by going and living our lives out there with such beauty and compassion and justice and grace and goodness that people see that. I mean, just think for a minute about some of the places that you go each week. 
You go to church. You go to work. You go to gym. You, you, you go to a yoga. You go to practice. You go to the doctors. You go hiking. You go to dance recitals. You go on vacation. We spend, frankly, the better part of our lives going places. And Jesus knew that that would be the tr case. And so he tells us, as you go, look for opportunities to point people toward me. Show them by your words and your life what my kingdom looks like. In fact, the, go, the word go here is even better translated, as you go, make disciples. And so, don't misunderstand me. Jesus is not adding another thing for us to go to. We already have enough things that we have to go to already. He is simply saying, as you go, go with a sense of mission. Remember, this was a grassroots movement that Jesus is launching here. This is for ordinary people. He's leaving behind this mission, not in the hands of uh, religious professionals, not to priests or rabbis or preachers. He leads this ministry, this movement, in the hands of tax collectors and, and, and fishermen, just the ordinary people in our world. But he says, as you go, look for opportunities to be used by God. Now, unfortunately, too often, this passage has been viewed as a missionary past uh, passage. It's for a few elect Christ followers who get a special calling from God to leave their lives behind and go to some far off and exotic place to do God's work. And there is certainly a global and cross-cultural dimension to this. And many people, at least some people, do indeed receive a special call from God to vocationally pursue that kind of a life. But this is fundamentally a miss mission passage before it's a missionary passage. It's about the call of God on all Christ followers to go through their everyday life, meeting the people that God places in their path and bringing them good news and the hope that Jesus offers. And so maybe a better word for this is not the great commission, but the great go mission. I remember thinking about this years ago when we started to build our church up in Westminster. And we realized, look, we can build a facility. And we did. But it was the people that were there each week going out into their daily, weekly lives, sharing the good news with them, that's the difference that it made. And so it starts with going. It starts with understanding that each of us, every one of us, is gifted with unique talents and abilities that can be used by God to reach people in the area that we find ourselves living. We all have different ways of doing that and contributing to God's work. Uh, the Denver metro area is home to more than 3 million people. 85% of them don't attend church. 30% of them have almost never been to a church for anything, which means that over a million people in our area I have no real connection or understanding about what church is at all. And yet, God is at work here at Connections and other gospel teaching churches where people are discovering what following Jesus is all about. And as they do, something happens. As people go and share that good news out there, the spiritual terrain of the area begins to change. You see, faith in Christ 
isn't just about offering hope and meaning and purpose to our individual lives. It can change our neighborhoods. It can change our region. It can change the world. More people growing in faith. More people being influenced in their workplaces and neighborhoods and schools. More people going to church and more people going from church each week. Because ask yourself, how likely is it that my neighbor or my coworker will just spontaneously decide on their own to go to church? I mean, they may be thinking, today I ought to go to the gym, but they probably aren't thinking, today I probably go, ought to go and join a, a community of Christ followers. But what would happen? What would happen? If, if we got in our hearts a, a sense of what Christ is calling us to do here, of going. I mean, what would happen here at Connections if every child were to learn from a very young age that God loves them just as they are, and he made them to do something special in this world? And what if every student here at Connections went into their middle school class or high school each day, not just trying to survive, but actually believing and knowing that they could make a difference in their world, in their gym, in their class, on their team? And what if every young adult, as they launched their career, launched it not just with an eye to make money and be successful, but with an eye to serving God through their work, believing that God placed them in the field of endeavor to do good in this world and to be involved with advancing his work? And what if every married couple here believed that God brought them together to love and to serve each other so passionately, so sacrificially, that they would be showing all the people that knew them how much Jesus loves them? What if every family came here, that lives here, is part of this church, came here believing that God placed them in the home in the neighborhood, in the apartment building, because there were people all around them that God would put in their path that could only be loved, only hear the grace and the truth of the gospel if they heard it from someone just like them. And what if every empty nester and every retiree took this season of our lives, not to just take a back seat, but to dedicate themselves to doing the Lord's work and investing in the next generation. And what if every Sunday more and more people gathered here in this facility to find healing and hope and forgiveness and life and what if every Monday those same people scattered throughout the metro area to their workplaces and neighborhoods to share that light with the people all around them? What would happen? Well, what would happen is the spiritual terrain of the region would begin to change. There would be more beauty and more kindness and more truth and justice. There would be more wonder. There would be more purpose. See, that's... Jesus' vision for his people. And for me, at least, it's a vision worth giving my very best toward. A vision worth giving my time and talent and treasure for. It's worth living sacrificially to help it become a reality. Because when we finally realize that we're called to go, and as we go to bring that life of Jesus to the people around us, when we finally catch that understanding, well, that's when the kingdom really does begin to see the fruits. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful that when you call us to go, you don't ask us to go alone. We go with each other. We go with your spirit. 
we go knowing that uh, you will provide for us. You will open doors for us. You will use our words with the people that you have those con we have those conversations with. And I just pray um, today for connections, this community, as this new year gets started, that, that there'll be a sense of, of what can happen when we live our lives out there sharing your good news with the people all around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.